Hello, my name is Jeff Wyma, and I'm a professor of New Testament at Calvin Theological Seminary. If you're watching this video, that means you've probably already seen some earlier ones on me on how to interpret the Bible, how to read the Bible for all it's worth. And so there I presented five key hermeneutical principles that one should follow when interpreting the Bible. And those key principles, again, were the Holy Spirit element, the idea that the Holy Spirit needs to work in our hearts and minds to properly interpret God's Word. Then we talked about the grammatical, the importance of language, literary, historical, and theological. And so now we're going to take those five somewhat abstract principles and apply them to a passage. The passage, as you can see, is 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18. And I've entitled this passage, Jesus is Coming Again, a word of comfort about deceased Christians at Christ's return. Now, I'm anticipating you're going to learn many interesting and important things about this passage and what God is saying to us in these words. But the bigger goal uh, is, that when, is that this passage will serve as an illustration for that hermeneutical approach we looked at earlier. And so again, although I hope you'll learn a lot and be benefited by our interpretation of this passage, the larger goal is it gives you a practical example of how to read the Bible for all it's worth. Because, of course, obviously in these courses we can't interpret every single passage of Scripture. And so our goal instead is to give you a method, to give you a strategy, which then you can apply on whatever part of God's Word you happen to be working. So with those preliminary comments, let's turn to this passage, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18. And before I read those words, let me spell out for you how this passage fits within the structure of the letter as a whole. By the way, this kind of question or discussion would fit under our Reformed hermeneutic under the category literary, because we're dealing with the form and the structure of the passage, not just what the biblical writer says, but how they say it. Now, you can see that uh, our passage falls in the second half of Paul's letter to the Thessalonians. All of Paul's letters have the same structure. He has an opening in which he uh, gives his name, the name of the church to whom he's writing, and then a greeting. And then he also has a thanksgiving section. And the important point for us now to be aware of, Paul foreshadows in that thanksgiving section the major topics of the rest of the letter to come. And so our passage, that is chapter 4, 13 to 18, the topic of Christ's second coming has already been foreshadowed in the thanksgiving section. You can see in chapter 1 of 1 Thessalonians, verse 3, and even more clearly in verse 10, Paul anticipates this discussion he's going to have later on in the letter about what happens to Christians who die before Jesus comes back. Now, the word comfort in that title is important because Paul, the pastor, is speaking more than Paul, the predictor. And so as we hear these words, and I'll say something more about this later on in our interpretation of this passage, the primary purpose of Paul in this passage is to comfort grieving Christians in the city of Thessaloniki. Well, let's turn then to our passage and hear what God is saying to the Thessalonians then and there, but also what God is saying to us here and now. Our text goes like this. Brothers, we do not want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep or to grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. We believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's own word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left till the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage each other with these words. Now that we've heard what God has said, let us think carefully about what God means, how we ought to interpret this passage.
And so now we take that five-fold Reformed hermeneutic and we apply it to our text for today. The first category is the Holy Spirit element, and that is the idea that the same Spirit that inspired Paul to pen these words needs to work in our hearts and our minds to properly interpret those words. Now, unlike the other four principles, this is more of a subjective category. And it's also a category that you won't really see in the process that you're going to uh, view now. Because um, I prayed for the leading of the Spirit, I asked for God's Spirit to work in me as I prepared these words that you're going to hear now. And so that's the first principle, the Holy Spirit element. And so we leave that first subjective category, which again is different than the other four, and we turn to the four more objective categories. And so the second, or for our purposes, we could call it the first, is then grammatical. And remember that grammar uh, involves looking at the original language. For the New Testament, that means Greek, and for the Old Testament, that means Hebrew, and once in a while, Aramaic. And the reason we do that is, I suggested before the motto, every translation involves interpretation. Our translations, as good as they may be, lose something. And so now we're asking ourselves, what can we learn from the original, in this case, Greek text that the English text can't tell us? And even if you're not a Greek geek like me, even if you don't know the Greek language, we can't overlook this step. We have to then surround ourselves with a good cloud of witnesses, that is, commentaries, scholars who know the language and can offer us insight into the text that we can't get perhaps on ourselves. So we can't just say, oh, this is all Greek to me and then ignore it and move on. No, we have to wrestle with what the original text says in the original language. And so let's look now at some examples in our passage. So the first example comes from verse 13, where we see it's one word in Greek, and it's translated in English as those who are asleep. Now the Greek verb here, koimao, literally means to sleep. But Paul, when he uses it in our passage, is not talking about, uh, you know, some people who you know, who kind of, you know, are bored and who knock off and literally fall asleep. No, he always uses it in his writings in a more metaphorical or symbolic way. And he uses it as a euphemism for death. Euphemism is just uh, an English way of saying something that's kind of harsh in a softer or more user-friendly way. Well, even today, we have a hard time sometimes saying that so-and-so has died. That sounds too harsh for us. And so we do have euphemisms to refer to death. We say and said things like, oh, so-and-so has uh, passed away, or so-and-so is no longer with us. Someone once joked that if you turn to the obituary column on any given day, there may be 10 people listed there, but only three of them have actually died. All the other seven have gone to be with the Lord or are no longer with us. And so uh, it's not surprising that just like today, already back then, in the ancient world, writers referred to death in a softer, more user-friendly way, such as sleeping. Now, this is important not just for understanding what Paul is saying, but also to correct a conclusion that sometimes is wrongly made. Some uh, biblical readers talk, read about uh, the text uh, referring to people who have fallen asleep, and they wrongly conclude, oh, that's what happens after people die. Their souls fall asleep. In other words, what happens to people from the moment they die until the moment they're resurrected bodily? Oh, that in-between time, it's often referred to as the intermediate state, oh, the souls just kind of fall asleep and then they wake up again when Jesus returns and their bodies are raised. But that's a wrong conclusion from the reference in our verse and elsewhere in Scripture to the idea of sleeping. Again, it's just a euphemism for death. And in fact, later on in our passage, Paul drops the euphemism. He uses sleep three times. But then he says, those who have died in Christ. He just says it straight out. 
And the problem with soul sleep is it's not supported by other teachings of Scripture. If we interpret Scripture with Scripture or compare one part of God's Word with another part of God's Word. For instance, in Luke 23, 43, that's Jesus' words to the thief on the cross, Today you will be with me in paradise. It's not like you'll knock off for a little while, your soul will sleep, and then one day down the road you'll wake up. No, today you'll be with me in paradise. Or Paul's words to the Philippians. Two times there in chapter 1, Paul says that for him to die is gain and is better by far. That doesn't sound like he's just going to be in a state of non-existence or in which his soul just kind of is in this no man's land. No, Paul envisions a conscious presence with Christ following death. And then also the text in Revelation 6, which refers to those martyrs, people who've been killed for no other reason than they're followers of Jesus and how they're involved in worship. So, in other words, don't misunderstand this reference to sleep. Another example uh, that illustrates the importance of the grammatical principle is Paul's words in verse 13, that you may not grieve. Now, Paul uses a, f- a kind of a, a special or more emphatic form of the Greek verb here, which stresses what? Which stresses the ongoing or continuous nature of the action. Or to put it differently, when Paul talks about grieving, he's not just talking about people who are a little bit down or depressed. He's talking about a kind of substantive, significant, ongoing grieving process. And this is a good reminder for me and for you that, again, Paul in this passage is primarily comforting his readers. Remember the title of our address. It's a word of comfort, first and foremost, our passage. And I stress that because way too many Christians, way too many Christian teachers have used this passage instead as a way to what? To predict the future, a kind of a blueprint for what yet God will do at the end of times. And that misuses or distorts this passage. First and foremost, Paul is trying to comfort these grieving Christians in the city of Thessaloniki. In verse 14, uh, Paul literally says in Greek, if we believe that Jesus died again. Now, sentences that begin with if are called conditional sentences. And actually, there's one, two, three different types of conditional sentences in the Greek language. And each of them have their own understanding or their own particular nuance. The one that's found here is called a first-class condition, and what that means is the speaker assumes the truth of the condition. In other words, the speaker says, if such and such is the case, and I believe it is, then, and then they give on the second half. And so when we read here, Paul says, if we believe Jesus died and rose again, it would be wrong for us to say, oh, The Thessalonians maybe didn't believe that Jesus died and rose again. Oh, that's what Paul is doing. He's trying to prove to them or convince them that Jesus really rose again. No, the Greek clearly shows that's not the case. And in fact, some translations are so sure of this that they render it differently. For example, the RSV and the new RSV translate verse 14, not as if we believe, but since we believe. And then the NIV, the text that I used as our base text for this presentation, they just simply drop it all together and turn it into a statement. And they say, we believe that. And of course, uh, this is not surprising because Paul clearly stressed the resurrection as of first importance. It no doubt was a big part of his missionary preaching as indicated by his comments to the Corinthians. Another important thing that the grammar tells us is that verse 14a might well be a confession of the early church. You know what a confession is, don't you? That's where the speaker speaks not their own words, but they quote something that the church as a whole believes or says. For example, if I'm preaching a sermon on spiritual warfare, Ephesians 6, and and then I suddenly say something like, For still our ancient foe does seek to work us woe. His craft and power are great, and armed with cruel hate on earth is not his equal. Now, I don't have to tell you that, oh, those aren't my words. 
you just hear them and you recognize them as, well, words of Martin Luther, words that I am quoting. And why might I quote something? Well, in order to give it greater emphasis. And also because you know those words. And that means it's not just me speaking. It's not just Martin Luther. It's the whole church because the whole church has sung those words and therefore believes those words for centuries. Well, in a similar way, Paul, like a preacher today, a good preacher today, Paul quotes too occasionally in his letters from either confessions or other hymnic material that the early church used. Now, how can we identify this? Why do we think that verse 14a may well be a kind of quote that Paul is making from a confession of the early church? And the answer has to do with the unique nature of a number of things about verse 14a. For example, reason number one, the introductory phrase where Paul says, if we believe that. Well, that's a formula used to introduce a creedal formula in another letter of Paul, Romans 10 verse 9. Well, maybe that's not convincing enough. We need more evidence before we draw that conclusion, and we do have more evidence. Reason number two is the fact that, that Paul uses the word Jesus alone. Now, this will probably sound surprising to you, but Paul actually hardly ever refers to Jesus as simply Jesus. Paul almost always refers to Jesus instead as the Lord or the Lord Jesus or the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul actually hardly ever refers to Jesus as just plain old Jesus. And he does that in this verse here. And that's another interesting fact. But maybe we need more to be convincing. And here's yet a third reason to suggest that Paul here is quoting something. And that's the verb he uses to refer to Jesus rising. He uses the Greek verb anistomy, which for Paul is rare. He only uses it four times and actually two times because two of these four are not really Paul's words. He's quoting from the Old Testament. And the reason it's so striking is Paul almost always uses a different verb to refer to Jesus rising. The Greek verb is egero, and he uses it 33 times. So Paul is very, very consistent. And so you have to ask yourself, how come Paul almost always uses this one verb for Jesus rising, but here he uses this rarer verb instead? Is that significant? And then a fourth and final factor, and that is this. Paul rarely speaks of Jesus rising from the death. Paul's language is always more precise. He always refers to God raising Jesus from the grave. And so we have these four unique characteristics all at play in the first part here of verse 14. And a, and a good logical conclusion would be the reason for all of these differences is that Paul is not writing these himself. These, these, aren't, these, these, these aren't his own words. No, he is quoting a confession of the early church. Now, maybe you're saying, well, big deal, who cares? Well, actually, this is important for interpretation because you have to ask yourself, if Paul is citing something, why is he citing something? How does that help him in his persuasive purposes in this passage? And as I hinted earlier in the example from Martin Luther's hymn, when a preacher quotes something, whether it's a hymn or in this case a confession, it adds authority to your words. In other words, Paul isn't just giving his own personal opinion or his own private belief. No, he's saying, I believe, you believe, indeed the whole church community believes that Jesus died and rose again. And so knowing that this is a quote, and again, the grammar, or in this case, the unique vocabulary, suggests to us that it is, that shows that Paul is adding weight to his argument here in 14. Another grammatical point is found in verse 15. And the unusual thing here in the Greek is that Paul uses a double negative. This is the most emphatic way to negate something in the original Greek language. And it's too bad that some translations, therefore, don't capture this translation. In other words, some translations have verse 15 simply, we will not precede those who have fallen asleep. But the Greek is quite clear. Paul says, and you have to add something in English, we will certainly not proceed, or we will absolutely not proceed, or we will by no means proceed. 
And you have to ask yourself again, why is Paul being so emphatic here? Is it because there were, in fact, some people who did say that Christians who were alive when Jesus comes again would proceed? In other words, is Paul so emphatic because he's trying to, uh, to oppose some alternate thinking? We'll come back to this later when we look at the historical context. Verse 17 has something that uh, most Christians are quite interested in. Uh, the translation is that we will be caught up. The Greek verb used here is the verb harpazo. Now, uh, Greek was relatively early on translated to Latin, and you perhaps have heard of the Latin translation of the Bible. It's called the Vulgate. And so when the Latin Vulgate came across this Greek verb, they translated it with the Latin verb rapare. And the Latin verb rapare is where we get our English noun rapture. Oh, now I've got your attention, right? Christians are quite interested in this topic of the rapture. Well, it's found only in this verse, verse 17. And this is a rather uh, complicated issue. And so because it's going to involve some other elements of our Reformed hermeneutic, I've decided to leave it at the very, very end of our discussion. So after we've worked through the rest of the passage with the other hermeneutical principles, then we'll come back in a more focused and deliberate way, examine the question of what does this verse, and indeed what does the rest of the scripture teach about this important subject of the rapture. The last example for grammar is found in verse 18, where the NIV translates it as encourage one another. Now, the Greek verb that Paul uses here, parakalete, is literally a verb which means to be called along one side, right? To be called along one side. And it's exactly the same verb and noun that's used in the Gospel of John to refer to the Holy Spirit. Who is the Holy Spirit? Well, among other things, he's one who's called to our side. That's a very powerful and comforting image, namely that Christians do not walk through life alone, but we have one who is called to our side. And in fact, some translations just take the Greek and they transliterate it. Maybe you've heard of the Holy Spirit referred to as the paraclete. That comes right from the same Greek verb. Or sometimes the sense of that is translated instead, and it's translated as the comforter. And the and the reason I'm highlighting this is it's a good reminder for me and again for you too that the primary purpose of this passage is not to predict the future. So when we come to this passage and we're all excited, oh, now we can finally find out what's going to happen yet, yet in what things are to come, we're really misusing this passage. We're distorting the Word of God because Paul's primary purpose in this passage is pastoral. His primary purpose is to comfort the Christians who are grieving in Thessaloniki. Well, that's the end of our second, or in this case, our first objective hermeneutical category, the grammatical. And we're going to move on now to the second or the third, however you're counting these. And that, as you may remember, is the heading literary, literary. Now, there are a bunch of questions we ask under this hermeneutical category, and one of the important questions is to take seriously what kind of literature our particular passage comes from. The technical term is genre, right? The Bible is one book made up of different kinds of writing, different kinds of genres, and so we have to know very clearly what kind of scripture passage we're dealing with. Are we dealing with a historical book? Are we dealing with an apocalyptic book? Are we dealing with a gospel? Are we dealing with poetry? In our passage for today, we're dealing with something that is obviously a letter or an epistle. And that means that we need to know something about letters of Paul's day, and especially the kind of epistolary conventions that is, these fixed sayings or these stereotyped expressions, which were very common in letters of that day, and thereby Paul and his readers knew about them, but are not so true of us today, and thereby we don't know about them. And so we have to kind of educate ourselves as to what these conventions might be. Now, 
One of the things we use literary uh, features for is to make sure we know where to begin a passage and where to end a passage. This is a very important uh, question because if we don't start in the right spot or end in the right spot, that increases the possibility that we distort a passage, that we make it say something that it was not intending to say, or maybe it's only a minor part in the uh, biblical text, but we magnify it and turn it into a major part. And so for every passage, it's always crucial to ask carefully, where do we begin and where do we end? Now you say, I know where to begin and end. I simply follow the chapter divisions in the Bible. And then you remember something, hopefully. You remember that while the chapter divisions weren't added to the Bible until the 11th century A.D., So these are not part of the biblical text. They're not inspired in any way. Some of the chapter divisions, of course, are okay and appropriate, but some of them, I think, are not. And so we're not controlled by that, nor by verse divisions, because they weren't added until about the 14th century. But that doesn't mean that the biblical writers didn't leave clues for us readers to know where to begin and end. They just left different kind of clues. Our clues today are things like, paragraph breaks, headings, and things like that. But writers in that day left literary clues. And so what are the literary clues which show that our passage does indeed begin at verse 13? Well, one literary clue is the vocative. The vocative is a special case in the Greek language. It's somewhat unique. It's a form of address Paul uses it many, many times, as other biblical writers do, as secular letter writers of that day do, to mark a transition, either to a uh, major unit uh, change or sometimes a subunit change. But it's the vocative brothers. Some translations go brothers and sisters. And, And we find that mark here in 413. We also see in 413 something that can be called a disclosure formula. Actually, it's a verb, or if I should say a saying, that focuses on the verb to know. Uh, our, our text, verse 13, can be literally translated, We do not want you not to know. And so whenever you hear Paul or other biblical writers use that key verb, know, that's a good sign you have that disclosure formula. And again, it's another transitionary device. It marks the beginning of something new. And we have that here in verse 13. We have yet a third literary clue that we begin something in verse 13, and that's the so-called now about formula. In Greek, it's two words. It's peride, peride, and it can be translated different ways. A common way to translate it is now about. It can also be translated but concerning, but in Greek, it's always the same, and therefore it's quite clear and easy to see, peride. And Paul uses it multiple times in the letter to the Corinthians, for example. The whole second half of 1 Corinthians, all the different topics are introduced by peride, now about, now about, now about. And here in 1 Thessalonians, we have not one, not two, but three occurrences of it in a row as well. In a paragraph just before ours, 4.9, Paul says, now about brotherly and sisterly love. That's a new paragraph. Paul is going to start something new. Then in a passage right after our 5.1, we read, now about the times and the seasons. Again, Paul has shifted gears and he's going to move to a new topic. And so now in our passage, 4.13, between these two examples, we have yet another example of now about, a clear sign that Paul is starting something new. Now, We can also look at the content to see if there is some shift at a particular point. Now, this can be sometimes misleading because Paul has a habit of, at least on a surface level, looking like he's moved on to another topic when he really hasn't. And so you have to be careful when you use content grounds to mark the beginning of a new passage. But when we take content shift and we support it with these literary devices, these epistolary conventions, well, then it gives us greater evidence. And so in the preceding passage, there's been nothing about Jesus coming again. It's been about um, holiness and sexual conduct and about brotherly and sisterly love. And so we meet a pretty dramatic shift in our passage where Paul now is talking about the second coming of Jesus and more precisely what happens to those who have fallen asleep, those who have died before Jesus comes again. So those are some good evidences that we start something new.
Now, where does the passage end? This actually is a little trickier because if you went by content alone, if you looked at chapter 5, 1, 2, 3, and following all the way to verse 13, you would see that chapter 5 also talks about the second coming of Jesus. And that's why there are a number of preachers and a few commentators who say, oh, 4.13 all the way to 5.11, all of it talks in a general way about the second coming of Jesus. And so they lump it all together. But we can see that there are instead a clear break. There are clear markers signifying a shift at 5.1. Yes, they both deal with the end times, but they're slightly different from each other in terms of the subject matter. So what are the evidences that our passage ends at 4.18? Well, first of all, in verse 18, Paul says, therefore, or sometimes it's translated, so then. In Greek, it's quite clear, it's hosta. Now, why do people in the pew get excited when they hear the preacher say, therefore? Well, they get excited because they know that the preacher, at least unless he's playing with them, is finally coming to an end, right? We're happy. It's drawing to a close. And so just the meaning of the word itself, therefore or so then, sounds like Paul is bringing his discussion to a close. But we can see that Paul actually uses this Greek word hosta a lot of times to bring his discussion to a close. You can see a bunch of examples from 1 Corinthians where that is the case. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, the whole chapter is about about um, about marriage and uh, whether uh, single people should remain single or get married. That whole discussion is introduced in 738 with hosta, so then, therefore. Or chapter 10 deals with meat sacrifice to idols. And that whole passage comes to an end with hosta in Greek, so therefore, so then. Chapter 11 is the passage on the Lord's Supper. And Paul again brings that discussion to a close by saying, therefore, or so then. In chapters 12, 13, and 14, he deals with spiritual gifts. And that long three-chapter discussion is marked by the conclusion, so then, therefore, in Greek, hosta. And then in 1 Corinthians 15, that's the powerful chapter on the resurrection. That whole chapter comes to a close also with those words, therefore, so then. So that marker, so then, or sometimes translated therefore, in our passage, chapter 4, verse 18, is a pretty clear marker that Paul is bringing this discussion to a close. But there are additional clues, too, that we should notice. In 5.1, we have another example of that vocative, which we saw mark the beginning of our passage, 4.13. So if 5.1 begins something, the natural conclusion would be the verse before that, which is 4.18, must end something. Or in 5.1, we get another of those now about or but concerning. In Greek, it's peri de formulas. And so again, if Paul is introducing something new in 5 verse 1, he must have just brought something to a close in the preceding verse in 4.18. And then we have yet another disclosure formula. Remember the key verb to know in chapter 5, verse 2. So a bunch of other clues that support the passage ending at 4.18. Here's another uh, marker that suggests that our passage is indeed from 4.13 to 18. And that is, I think there's an inclusio here. What's an inclusio? Inclusio is the repetition of a key word or phrase at the beginning and the end, acting like bookmarks, marking out a passage. Well, here we don't have a verbal inclusio. Paul doesn't use exactly the same words in verse 13 and then repeat them in verse 18. But we have more of a thematic inclusio. Because our passage, as we'll see in a little bit, uh, starts off with a problem, the problem of grieving. But then in verse 18, we have the solution. Paul says, comfort one another. And so it looks like the problem that's been introduced has been resolved. And once the problem's been resolved, well, that's a natural place to come to an end or a close. Well, one more piece of evidence to show that the passage ends at 4.18 and also, I guess, begins at 4.13. And that is our passage has a different kind of character, if you will, from the passage before it and the passage after it. The passage before it and after it both deal with, and these are my uh, words, previously shared topics. In other words, Paul in the preceding passage of ours and the one after there, in a certain says, been there and done that. In other words, we've already talked about these things before. Notice what Paul says in 4.1. We instructed, 
Now, when did Paul instruct it? Well, it must have been when he visited them, right, for three plus weeks. Or in 4.2, he says, what instructions we gave, past tense. When did Paul give them those instructions? Well, again, when he was visiting them, when he established the church. 4.6, Paul says, just as we have already told you. When did he tell them? Well, he told them when he was there, again, for those three plus Sabbaths. And then 4.11, just as we told you. So everything in 4, 1 to 12, in a certain sense, isn't new for the Thessalonians. Paul again says, been there and done that. When we were with you, you know, originally establishing the church, we talked about all of these things. You know all of this already. And then we get to 4, 13, and Paul says, we do not want you to be ignorant. Or remember, literally in Greek, it says, we do not want you not to know. Oh, that's different, isn't it? I guess I didn't tell you anything about what happens to Christians who die before Jesus comes again. Do you see how 4.13 is different from the material beforehand? The material beforehand, you know, Paul had previously shared all this material with them. Our passage, in a certain sense, is introducing something new. Paul never ever clarified what happens to those who have fallen asleep, those who have died before Jesus comes again. What happens to them when Jesus comes again? And then our next passage is also uh, different because then Paul reverts to previously shared material. Now, 5, 1 to 11, in a similar sense, deals with the second coming, but it's different because this now is not new. Notice what Paul says in 5, 1. We do not need to write to you, all right, about the times and the seasons. Why doesn't Paul need to write to them about the time and the seasons? Well, because he had already told them about it. They know that already. And then verse 2, he says, For you know very well that the day of the Lord will da-da-da-da-da-da. They don't just know it. They know it very well. How can they know it very well? Because, again, Paul had covered that when he had been with them earlier. And so you can see that our passage, the boundaries of our passage are quite clearly set apart from the material beforehand, which deals with previously shared topics, and the passage that comes afterward, which also deals with previously shared topics. And I've spent some time dealing with these boundaries, not because there's a huge debate, almost all scholars agree that you begin at 4.13 and you end at 4.18, but I want to make a point for you, because not all passages are so clear. I want you to, for whatever passage of scripture you're going to preach on or teach or reflect on, that's an important part of exegesis. You have to ask yourself, how do I know that we begin here? How do I know that I ought to end here? And a good part of that are these literary clues that the biblical writers have left for us. Because there's still a couple of more things about literary that we need to cover. Very important things, and let's talk about those right now. And that has to do with the structure of the passage, the internal argumentation of Paul. I've called it here the map quest of our passage. You know what a map quest does. It helps you get from point A to point B. You just don't start driving in your car and start driving around hoping you'll get there eventually. I know sometimes men want to do that. That's not a good strategy, right? You normally go to MapQuest so you know the most efficient and direct way to get from point A to point B. And in a certain sense, when we do exegesis, we have to ask, how does the biblical writer get from the beginning of the passage to the end of the passage? In this particular case, how does Paul get from the grieving that he talks about in verse 13 to the comfort that he finally highlights for his readers in verse 18? And Paul, again, has a strategy. Paul doesn't just start talking. I hope that you don't know any preachers who do that. They just get on the pulpit and start talking, and then they look at their watch and go, oops, I guess it's time to end. No, a good preacher or a good teacher has a strategy. They think carefully about where they're going to go and what order the points are going to be in, the most effective and persuasive and clear way to present the material. And Paul does exactly that. He is a not just a writer, but a gifted writer. A gifted writer who, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, thinks carefully not just about what he's going to say, the content, but how he's going to say it, the form. And this involves literary analysis. Literary analysis, regardless of what genre of scripture you're dealing with, thinks carefully not just about what the biblical writer says, the content, but the how. There are a lot of ways to say something, 
But why did they say it in this way? Why in this particular form and structure? Now, when we look at our passage, Paul does have a clear map, a road map in mind, and I think it goes like this. Verse 13, he starts off with an assertion. He says, I don't want you to grieve like others do who have no hope. Now, that sounds negative. Maybe we'll spin it positively. In other words, Paul is asserting that Christians should grieve differently than non-Christians. They should grieve with hope. And then he has to give some grounds for why he says that. And he does that in verse 14. And he introduces it with a little word. Don't ignore little words. They're very important, especially for showing the connection from verse to verse. It's a little word for. In Greek, right, it's gar. In other words, Paul says, the reason I'm asserting what I did in verse 13 is for, right? It's it's for this reason or this cause. And we look at verse 14. It deals with what Jesus has done, or if you want to be more precise, what God has done through Jesus, namely his resurrection. And as we talked about earlier under grammar, Paul likely here is quoting a confession of the early church. So in other words, verse 14 is the first statement that grounds or undergirds the assertion he made in verse 13. Then we get to verse 15 and we see another little word that he begins that verse with. It's again in Greek, gar, translated as for, because now Paul is going to give a second ground, a second causal clause, a second reason why you should be convinced about what he has asserted in verse 13. And here the cause is different. If in verse 14 the cause is because Jesus has done something, here in verse 15 it's because Jesus has said something. Paul appeals to, in his words, the word of the Lord. Paul has some teaching from Jesus which proves the point that he has already been making in verse 13. Now, in verse 16, we meet in English a word that might throw you off. We meet yet another four. And you might think, oh, here's yet a third ground. Four, 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 three in a row. But then the Greek helps us because it's a different word in Greek in verse 16, even though in English it's exactly the same. And so, again, you see how grammar helps us here. And we realize that this isn't actually a third new or different causal clause. But actually, Paul is fleshing out, he's giving a fuller explanation of the second cause that he's introduced already in verse 15. And then in verse 18, we get the word that I'm sure that hearers then were excited about. Remember the word, therefore, or so then, the words that sound like Paul is drawing his discussion to a close. And so if we restructure this outline, it, I think, looks a little more uh, in, in a neat fashion like this. So again, he begins with an opening assertion, and that's in verse 13. And the opening assertion is, Christians grieve for deceased believers differently than non-Christians grieve, right? We grieve with hope. Now that's a powerful assertion, Paul. How can you say that? How can you say that Christians, even in the midst of death, have hope? Paul says, I'm glad you asked. I've got two reasons for that. One reason is because, in my words now, of the weighty word of the church. Remember, we said earlier under our grammatical analysis that Paul in verse 14 is likely quoting a confession of the early church. And he's appealing to what? The resurrection of Jesus. And we're going to develop this later on, but Paul's logic is this. Jesus' resurrection is a guarantee of Christians' resurrection. You know those Christians in Thessaloniki who have fallen asleep who have died? And so if Jesus has rose, well, then that means these dead Christians will rise. And if they are going to rise, that means they will be there when Jesus comes again. They won't miss out. They won't be at a disadvantage. They'll share and participate equally in the glory of Jesus' return. And then after giving that first reason in verse 14, he gives then the second reason in verses 15, 16, and 17. If the first reason involves a weighty word of the church, the second reason involves a weighty word of the Lord, that is the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Paul has received some teaching directly from Jesus, which assures the believers that we who are living, right, who are alive when Jesus comes again, will what? Will certainly not. There's that double negative. We will absolutely not be ahead of those who have already fallen asleep. In other words, living Christians will share equally with deceased believers who are now resurrected and transformed. All Christians, living and resurrected, will participate fully and equally in the glory of Jesus' return. And then after those two grounds, well then Paul naturally can bring his discussion to a close. He can say, therefore, or so then, comfort one another with these words. And so it's very important for us when we go through these verses, we don't lose the forest for the trees, as we sometimes say in English. We get so excited by each individual verse or each word in each individual verse that we don't understand the big picture view, that we have a clear sense of how Paul is developing his argument and how every verse within that fits within his persuasive or his rhetorical strategy. Well, hopefully now I have indeed come to the end of our literary analysis and we'll turn next in our uh, upcoming video to the remaining two hermeneutical categories, uh, the historical approach to the text and also the theological.